now get the news conference and the formal announcement underway. It is always a pleasure and privilege for me to introduce the 12th president of the University of Kentucky. I remind him he has just started his fourth year, and it's incredible what's been happening around this place. Please welcome the president of the University of Kentucky, Dr. Eli Capaluto. Thank you, Carl. Uh, good morning. I have to tell you, this is one gratifying week to be the president of the University of Kentucky. And why do I say that? On Tuesday, I spent the day with Congressman Hal Rogers, CDC Director Tom Frieden, as we talked with community partners and stakeholders engaged in SOAR, our initiative to shape our Appalachian region. And the purpose of Tuesday's symposium was to gather experts, many of whom came from the University of Kentucky, who had worked shoulder to shoulder with community members uh, to further advance better health. We announced two initiatives that day. One was a CDC-supported grant to help patients who get that dreaded diagnosis of cancer then navigate the health system. It's not so easy to find the best care that fits for you and your family. Where are you treated, or is it in your own backyard, or can you go somewhere else for the very best of care? That's not an easy thing to do. So we're gonna have a patient navigation system that we will embed in communities, not just in Kentucky, but throughout Appalachia, so that people can get the best of care. The second program we announced was the CLIC program, Community Leader, Leadership Institute of Kentucky. So we think the answer to the problems that face community rest in community. That's where the genius lies to tackle many of the problems of the day. So we wanted to further empower community. This leadership institute, which will provide stipend, technical support, education, let community members create innovations to tackle problems in their community, which they best understand. So I think we're gonna create an on army of social and health entrepreneurs uh, to tackle the issues that are closest to community. So here we are again today, a world-class, faculty, expressing their ingenuity to combat another Kentucky nuisance, opioid use. And Dr. Wormling, that video captures everything we're about. You know, when I heard him say at the beginning of that video, and you know, that's where I grew up. That's my community. So that is why we are all here, is to serve community. And what he did is you, you, you first create something in a laboratory and test its efficacy under ideal situations, will it work? And then you want to look at its effectiveness, how it works you know, in the field. And what you did to touch the entire environment so that it could be possible that this is effective from looking at policies and laws and so forth. There's another reminder of how you have to work hand in hand with community elected officials to take something you may discover in the laboratory and translate it to effective use in the community. And it represents what Kentucky is about. It represents our commitment to serve families and it represents our commitment to overcome an epidemic uh, that is hurting too many families in this state. So thank you, Dr. Wimling. Thank you for your entire team, uh, your partners from the College of Pharmacy, throughout our Academic Health Center, the University of Kentucky, National Institute on Drug Abuse, the Kentucky Science and Technology uh, Corporation, and Rickett Ben Kaiser. This type of innovation and the work that led to it embodies the main mission of the University of Kentucky. That's education, research, and more than anything else, 
our service to our fellow citizens. Our commonwealth is only strong if every community is strong. And every community will only be strong when every community is healthy. We take another step in that direction today. That is the work of a 21st century land grant research university. I thank you very much. Thank you, President Capilouto. A gentleman that we were able to convince to come to the University of Kentucky several years ago came to take this great college of pharmacy to even higher heights, if you will. I need to go to uh, English 101, I think, and learn my vocabulary. But anyway, I'll get more descriptive. But Dr. Tim Tracy came here, was rolling right along as the dean of the College of Pharmacy, then was asked by the president to fill in as interim provost. He served admirably in that capacity for a little over a year. And now he is thrilled, and I do mean thrilled and delighted, to be back at the helm leading the UK College of Pharmacy. Please welcome Dr. Tim Tracy, the Dean of the UK College of Pharmacy. And thank all of you for coming out today for what is a special day for the University of Kentucky and the College of Pharmacy. Obviously, this is also a special moment for Dr. Dan Wormerling who's not only a professor here at the college, but he's also an alumnus and a Kentucky native. You often hear of those, of those of us in higher education talk about retaining our best and brightest, making sure they stay in Kentucky and help solve Kentucky problems. Today, we celebrate Dan's efforts to solve a problem facing each and every Kentucky community. For those of us who have given our careers to healthcare research, we all dream of having our product leave our laboratory and end up at the bedside. I can imagine the feeling that Dr. Wormling felt when he learned that his startup company, Antiop, received fast-track designation from the FDA recently. These are the moments that make all those long hours worthwhile. In our world, translational research, bringing an idea from the bench to the bedside, is the ultimate end goal the thing that drives us during those down moments and periods of frustration. Fortunately, at the University of Kentucky, through our National Clinical and Translational Science Award, we have UK's Center for Clinical and Translational Science. This research infrastructure challenges, encourages, and supports investigators to accelerate science to tangible improvements in public health. This project represents that translational spirit of research so well and is an outstanding example of how the support provided by our Center for Clinical and Translational Research helps investigators like Dr. Wormerling turn their dreams into reality. Opioid overdose is a growing problem across our Commonwealth, affecting families in every corner of Kentucky. As we see in media reports nearly every day, opioid addiction is destroying families, dashing the hopes and dreams of too many of our fellow citizens. This nasal delivery system of naloxone, which reverses the deadly effects of opioid overdose, will provide another tool on the front line of this epidemic. Our hope is that the fruit of this project will help Kentucky's opioid overdose, overdose problem very soon. I also wanted to take a moment to discuss this important project from an economic development standpoint. This College of Pharmacy takes great pride in commercializing its intellectual property to help diversify and strengthen Kentucky's high-tech economy. Since 1989, the UK College of Pharmacy faculty have created 25 startup companies. Dr. Wormerling's company, Antiop, carries forward this rich pharmacy tradition. Before I close, I must also give kudos to one more member of the UK College of Pharmacy family. It's certainly a very close-knit community. And in this regard, Dr. Wormerling's naloxone work is an evolution of research conducted by a former faculty member, Dr. Anwar Hussein, who happened to publish a paper about the potential nasal delivery of naloxone in the 1980s. Congratulations, Dr. Wormerling, on this exciting announcement. I applaud you for your work, and I thank you for your commitment to solving this pressing problem. This is a shining example of what I like to call 
unique solutions from Kentucky for Kentucky, fulfilling our mission as a land-grant university. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Tracy. Our next speaker, another example of the collaborative effort here involving the different units and different colleges across this campus, as so much of our research does. Dr. Katherine Martin is the director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry in the University of Kentucky College of Medicine. Please welcome Dr. Katherine Martin. I was really honored when Dr. Wormley invited me to be part of this research team and help with the clinical aspect of the uh, implementation of the uh, study. Um, my concern is a clinician. We know that pharmaceutical opioids are the number one cause of death over, by overdose in Kentucky. While this cause of death is decreasing because some of the legal changes in how we handle prescriptions, op heroin overdoses are increasing. And we know that over the past 10 years, heroin overdose, opiate op overdoses have been quadrupled. And Kentucky is twice the national rate of overdose deaths. So we also need to be aware that Kentucky has one of the highest prescription rates for opioids in the country. So that means there are more opioids in our households than many states. So while we, now we have an opportunity to have a safety net nasal spray naloxone. So I think we really want to be excited about this forward effort to distribute this intervention into households to make families safer and decrease the risk of having opioids in the household. And I'm very concerned about this as a child psychiatrist and a psychiatrist, and I'm very excited Dr. Wormley's agreed to join my team. We are rolling out an adolescent substance abuse treatment and training program in a collaboration with the state and UK Healthcare, and we're going to ask him to be part of that, spreading the word. Thank you. And the collaboration continues. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Next up, a gentleman who has long been involved in helping better the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Please welcome the president of the Kentucky Science and Technology Corporation, Chris Kimmel. Chris. Thank you, congratulations, Dan, University of Kentucky, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here today. I think what, what this is illustrative of is a lot of things that I think are, are critical. One, obviously, is what we've heard here before, the amazing impact uh, that this type of, of um, uh, innovation is going to have on the health and well-being of both the state and, and individuals. And that, that, of course, is the most important thing. Actually, Dan and I have known each other for a number of years. Um, the Kentucky Science Technology Corporation, um, which is involved in a lot of things, and one of the things we focus uh, a lot on is solutions. Uh, solutions in the, taking ideas from research and putting those into the marketplace in lots of different areas, whether it be advanced materials, uh, advanced manufacturing, biomedical applications, uh, et cetera. And uh, we were very pleased uh, to be a financial supporter uh, of Dan's work um, through a project that was we do we manage or execute for the Cabinet for Economic Development, which is an SBIRSTR match program. And I think we provided in excess of about 650000 uh, through that cabinet program uh, to Dan to help his to help his work uh, move on and so we're um, very very pleased to have that kind of success um, the other thing I, I want to just say a few words about is Dan we were talking before I, I came up and he was saying that this really is the, re the the culmination of a lot of different people and a lot of different ideas coming together over his his uh, the history of putting this together and that's really what um, creativity and innovation is really all about it is about the ability to basically deconstruct and reconstruct knowledge and, and bring it together in new and novel ways. And if you look at this particular, the, the process, the evolution of the development of this, it involves lots of different things. It involves medicine, it involves uh, biotechnology, it involves design in terms of the design of the apparatus itself. And one of the most important things, I think, that this represents for Kentucky is that this has a product and an idea that was designed and developed and invented here. You know, historically, we have done a very good job in Kentucky of putting together other people's ideas. Uh, and in today's world, that's not enough. We have to be able to create our own ideas 
and our own products and be able to execute those if we are going to, to be successful in today's world. You know, today there are two kinds of organizations in the world, innovative and dead. Uh, and I think this, rep, this is an example of the type of thing that has to happen much more frequently in Kentucky uh, if we are in fact going to be successful uh, recruiting, retaining, growing the talent and the know-how that is going to be uh, critical for our success. So again, I, I applaud Dan for his, not only for his work, but his, for his persistence. Uh, this was not something that happened overnight. He's been working on this for a long time, and persistence, I don't know if you know, is one of the, the number one, the first characteristic, the most important characteristic of, of entrepreneurs and creative people is persistence. Uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Mahendra Jain, the back who heads up the SBIR program for us, and the cabinet, and certainly the University of Kentucky, uh, for their support and vision in supporting his efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Well said. And last but certainly not least, he is a longtime professor of pharmacy practice and science in the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. Please welcome Dr. Dan Wormling. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on a, a few of the comments. Um, first, this is a project that has a much longer legacy than these grants. And in thinking about my comments for today, I was reminded that Dr. Catherine Martin's father is considered from the era of the 60s and 70s as a professor of neuropharmacology and anesthesiology here at UK is one of the world's leading understanding uh, experts in opioid pharmacology and also of the antagonists that we're talking about today that can be the antidotes. And so as I'm preparing the new drug application and doing the writing, I'm pulling out the historical articles that explain how naloxone actually works. And I put the, back, the two back together again because Catherine's been helping us on the medical aspects of running the projects and I'm going, this is her dad again. <laughs> And I'm, I'm using his references and his papers to make presentations to the FDA. So that's an element of the legacy that goes back to the 60s and 70s. The second part of the legacy is what Dr. Tracy mentions, and that's with Dr. Anwar Hussein, who in 1979 was a pharmaceutics professor of mine. And so I started to learn a little bit about drug delivery through him through the 70s and 80s, and then in working with him on some of his projects through the 80s and 90s. And so Dr. Hussein was an innovator in, in nasal drug delivery. And then for my own personal training here, Dr. Thomas Foster, who is unfortunately now deceased, but he was my mentor uh, through my training here at the university and also in my professional life. He was my next door office neighbor uh, th through my time here as a professor. And much of this is related to him as well. And the comment that you made about persistence is exactly what Tom used, because when I finished my fellowship in 1987, he provided me a framed poster, and it was a quote from Coolidge where the end of it says, persistence and determination are omnipotent. And that's how Tom led his life, and I was, as you were reflecting on your comments, that was a word and a phrase that I have used in trying to run my professional life. And so the fact that you chose that word I thought was uh, quite interesting. So I am persistent, some would say stubborn. Uh, but I am sort of on a track and I go. Uh, secondly, this was about a team. Our company is an N of one. We're virtual. We don't own anything. But we do lease a lot of things. We lease expertise and knowledge and equipment and other people's things. You know, this is sort of my third company and so you learn from all of your other mistakes, right? And so we are able to do things cost effectively. So far we have raised and spent about uh, seven and a half million dollars in all to get this drug to late stage. The last uh, dosing of the clinical study is actually tomorrow. And we hope to be able to file a new drug application for this later this year and hope by this time next year, FDA's review willing, that we would actually have a drug approved and available uh, commercially. So the story for that part now is about five years old. So we started uh, 
and actually received our first grant July of 2010, and so over the course of five years, and with that amount of funding, and the help of a lot of people, including the CTSC and the resources we have at the medical center, has uh, helped make this happen. This is also something that's helped because the government wanted it. <laughs> and so when ONDCP, when the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy and the Centers for Disease Control and NIDA, and all the government entities um, have now decided that this is an important part of medicine, um, then they can be very helpful in making things happen. And so I'm very grateful for the fast track designation that FDA made because this is a priority for them. They have an obligation, since they're approving the opioid medications on one side, that there's also a demand now for having the antidote more accessible. And so the FDA uh, and other government offices uh, have been very helpful and making this go through. So they're, they're very timely and working with us where you normally would hear the reputation that working with FDA is uh, waiting for uh, you know, wheels to grind and things like that. So we haven't had that kind of action or uh, reception with the Food and Drug Administration. Um, the last comment I'll make really is more oriented towards um, my students. And the the way that this got started was from Dr. Doug Steinke, who is no longer on our faculty. He is now in Scotland at another university. But in May of 2009, he handed me a paper called Save by the Nose, Expanding Access to the Opioid Antidote, Naloxone. And I read that, was reading that paper, and he says, Dan, you can do this. You can make this product for them. And I looked at it, and I said, you know, you're probably right. And then the next month in June of 2009 is when Michael Jackson died. Not that I'm, you know, big into that, but um, <laughs> the, uh, at the same time, the CDC released the latest data from 2008, which showed the, the horrendous statistics on opioid overdose and that Kentucky was in a really bad place. And the curves on this were accelerating, not flattening out. So I looked at that. And then the same week, MSNBC.com published an article describing two Moorhead State University students who went into a 30-day voluntary detox program in Mount Sterling. And uh, within weeks after their release from the detox program, uh, went back to their uh, substance abuse disorder and started using opioids and other substances again. And within weeks, they both died. And so that was sort of my week where I said, kind of like that 1976 movie called Network, where I said, I've had enough. And that's when I started writing, and writing the FDA, and writing within the university, and uh, writing at NIDA and NIH to try to get this project started. And so the message for the students is, is that I was looking at this for a long time, but I was looking for somebody else to do it. Where's the leadership? And I was looking for it. And I said I was willing to join. But in some cases, after you watch it for a while and you can't really see what's happening, then maybe that's time for you to step up. And so that's what kind of got me started in 2009 on writing where the uh, um, networking from one of my professional colleagues, Dr. Steinke, and in reading other reports of how uh, through the CDC and then through local reporting in the state of what a problem we have. Thank you very much.